I legit was about to drive off. And I'm like, no, no, I can't do it. I was about to drive off. And then she responded to her text and she was like, oh, I'm here, honey, come up. Just say my name at the door. They'll let you in. And I'm like, all right, bam. Walked in there and had the night of my life. I went from being like super duper nervous to within about like five, 10 minutes, walking around this party full of people, complete strangers, butt naked. If is everybody naked? Like I was, <laughs> not everyone else was. <laughs> so you were ready to rock? I was just like, ah, screw it. We good? Dude, I haven't I haven't done room tone since I've been on set. <laughs> oh, you had, you had to do that? On yeah, we had to do that on set, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, so like, bring, you're bringing back all these memories, Mike. <laughs> So I'm I'm looking forward to this conversation because I've I've seen sort of stuff which you've been putting out recently and obviously your your boys with the the tape brothers and automatically if you're friends with them then you have my interest and I want to know you know more about what it is that you do. So when people come up to you now and they ask what you do for a living, how do you answer that question? Depends who's asking the question. Okay, so depends. Okay, if it's if it's like a kid from oh, yeah, yeah, it's yeah. obviously recognize me. Yeah, right? yeah. Okay, obviously I'm doing YouTube. If it's, I don't know, like a government official or a banker or somebody at the airport, mm -hmm. well, I do email marketing, uh, which is technically also true. Yeah. Because that's how I make my money through email. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And if sometimes if it's a chick, then I might pull the adult entertainment mm -hmm. thing out the bag just to flex a little bit. <laughs> but it depends upon who, the, like, depends upon the vibe I'm getting off of it. Yeah. Because either I would imagine girls are either going to be intrigued and turned on, or they're going to be like freaked out and be like, "Whoa, bro!" Yeah, it just knocks them like off the off the fence. Mm. Like one way or another, they're either like super duper like into it, mm -hmm. or maybe not even necessarily into it, but just so curious yeah. about it that they can't help themselves, mm -hmm. or it's a complete no go. Yeah. And usually, it's a complete no go if they haven't met me first. Mm -hmm. Like if, if if they've met me first and then they kind of find out about it, it's always okay. They always somehow magically get over it. Mm. I think I'm just too damn charming, Mike. Yeah, I, I, I can imagine it's like it's like a bit of a taboo topic, but at the same time, I think it's like it's normal because you know we all do it. And like pretty much almost everybody, especially if you're a dude, at least once you've seen porn. Yeah, exactly, and it's. I, I'm, I'm in this interesting position now, having sort of stepped back from, you know, the filming side of it quite significantly. And I'm out here kind of trying to help the average dude be better in the bedroom, right? Mm. That's kind of my thing now, right? And a lot of guys, especially younger guys, have a serious problem with how much they jerk off to porn. Mm. They are just... And they do it too much. They do it so habitually that it screws up every other aspect of their life. And you can see that in like yeah. their, their habits, their, the way they carry themselves, what they, what they end up, like the, how successful they are, their fitness, their diet, their discipline, everything gets, their dating life especially, mm. everything else gets screwed up because they have this one really bad habit. And I kind of look at porn the way I would look at like cigars or alcohol. And it's like, I know, like, I like to uh, enjoy a good cigar. Mm -hmm. And I know perfectly well that cigars are not super duper healthy for me. Yeah. I'm well aware of that. I still enjoy them because I'm an adult and I'm able to make my own decisions, be they good or bad. Mm -hmm. So I'm able to indulge in that vice every now and then. Same with alcohol. I know alcohol ain't great for me, but I enjoy a beer here and there. So I'll indulge in that vice. I can be aware of the fact that these things are bad for me without wanting to, you know, pick at the government to say, make them illegal, ban them completely. Yeah. Right. And so I think there's a degree of, well, not just a degree, like quite a lot of responsibility that people need to take when it comes to these kind of bad habits. Mm -hmm. So I'll say to guys straight up, look, if you're having any kind of problem in the bedroom at all, the first thing I'll tell you to do is to stop watching porn and stop jerking off. The first thing I'm going to tell you that might sound a bit you know, hypocritical because I produce, like I make the stuff, right? Mm -hmm. But there are people who can consume that product and not develop a bad habit. Yeah. And it won't screw their life up. Great. Because they'll only watch it every so often. Yeah. Same with alcohol. There's people who can consume alcohol and it doesn't screw their life up. Mm. There's other people you give them a, 
a bottle and they're living under a bridge, mm -hmm. you know? So I think there's a degree of personal responsibility that's required on the part of the consumer to know, like, be self-aware, like, is this screw me over? Mm -hmm. Do I have a problem? Do I have a bad habit? If so, I need to fix it, right? And rather than try looking to like blame the the producer or the creator, mm -hmm. like no one's putting a gun to your head and saying jerk off. Yeah, yeah. No one's done that, you know. So guys can go on these sort of big anti-porn tirades, and uh, you know, say porn is evil, porn is bad, the industry needs to be shut down. But at the same time, like if you can't. If you have so, so little self-control, you can't stop jerking it. Maybe you should look in the mirror first. Mm -hmm. Got to my take on it. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. I think uh, for most guys who do have this issue, when you tell them stop watching it, can they usually just listen to you and be like, "Okay, I'm going to stop"? Like, what? What is the? I mean, obviously, the easiest way to stop is just to stop. But I imagine some people just can't. Yeah, it's a bit harder for others. Depends upon how habitual it becomes. So what I actually kind of prescribe for guys is a thing called a dopamine detox. Because mm. it's all very much related. Like the reason why habitual porn use screws dudes over so much is it can stuff up their dopamine receptors, right? So you get exposed to like a ton of novel pornographic material. Your brain is just constantly being bombarded with that, that degree of novelty, right? Mm -hmm. So when you eventually get a single beautiful woman in front of you rather than like 20, 30 different tabs of porn with 20, 30 different women doing different things, that one woman isn't as novel. The dopamine response your body gets is nowhere near the same. So the guy doesn't get excited anymore, right? Yeah. So one of the things that can help guys get kind of reset their brain a bit is to do a dopamine detox. And that's not just around porn, but the baby steps they can take before they can to make it much, much easier to stop porn entirely is cutting out things like super sugary foods, like high, really like high, high glycemic index carbohydrates, right? Things that give you that real kind of rush mm. when you eat them. Cutting out alcohol, right? Cutting out yeah, social media. social media, right? Endless scrolling. If you can start cultivating these little habits of cutting these things out that all screw with your dopamine, okay, well then... It, naturally that positive momentum is going to make it much much easier for you to stop jerking off to porn every night yeah so basically anything that gives you like instant gratification with like no work required yeah yeah we don't know how to have delayed gratification anymore mm. in, in like the the tiktok age yeah. that attention span has just disappeared entirely you know, it's, it's it's i think I and mean, you said you were 32 right yeah yeah i think we're very blessed to have been born before the iPhone. Yeah. I think anyone who was born, like who kind of had their teenage years prior to the iPhone coming out is super, super blessed. Yeah, my, my first phone was a Nokia. It was black and white, no camera. It had Snake on it and that was about yeah, it. Yeah, everyone, everyone loves Snake. Yeah. I remember with the, my Nokia, I used to be able to, when I was driving with one hand, have the Nokia in my pocket and I could, I had the muscle memory down so good, I could text <laughs> somebody. Like I could find their contact. I could say, Mike, like dinner, 9 p.m., steak, whatever. And I could send that text and it would be flawless, no mistakes, from my pocket without looking at the phone at all while driving. And then I remember getting my first smartphone and I couldn't do that anymore because you can't like, yeah, yeah. I didn't know, the, you know, I'm like, this is trash. Like these are nowhere near as good as the <laughs> <laughs> So I want to know a little bit about your your upbringing and your earlier years because I'm curious to know how you got into this industry. Was it something that you like enjoyed or did you realize, oh, I'm actually good at this, so maybe I could excel in this line of work? It was the latter and it came about. So I, when I was in my mid-20s, I got into the swingers scene in Western Australia. Mm -hmm. And I got into it as a single guy, which is super hard to do. But somehow I managed to finagle my way in and I started getting invited to parties. Yeah. Right. And I remember the first party I ever went to, I got invited by like this single girl. So single girls are allowed to bring along like a plus one mm -hmm. like, to try and even out the man to woman ratio of the party. So it's not a sausage fest, basically. 
uh, well, so it's not a, well, whatever. Anyway, I remember rocking up to the address, and she wasn't. Re- she was already in the party, and she wasn't responding to my text. And I'm sitting there, like legit, like heart pounding. I'd never been to a party like this before. I'm like super nervous. Mm. Like, I see, I see, like couples sort of walking into this apartment block, like, and the woman's wearing like a big fur overcoat, so you know she's wearing like lingerie <laughs> underneath. And I'm like. No, they're definitely going. She's hot. God damn it. There's another one. Oh, God, she's hot too. Shit. And I'm sitting there like, and she hasn't responded. I'm like, and I legit was about to drive off. And I'm like, no, no, I can't do it. I was about to drive off. And then she responded to her text. And she was like, oh, I'm here, honey. Come up. Just say my name at the door. They'll let you in. And I'm like, all right, bam. Walked in that and I had the night of my life. I went from being like super duper nervous to within about like five, 10 minutes, walking around this party full of people, complete strangers, butt naked. Is everybody naked? Like I was. <laughs> Not everyone else was. <laughs> Ready to rock. I was just like, ah, screw it. And like, I mean, there was some people. I wasn't the only guy with like shirt cocking. But <laughs> walking around, butt naked with a boner, just sitting there with a beer in my hand, talking to, to people. And I'm like, and then a- at the end of the party, I sort of put on like a climactic finish for everyone else who sort of gathered around and watched. And I remember thinking to myself, this is like the space I'm comfortable. Mm, you excelled. Yeah, like that. It's it. I'm a performer. Yeah, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Like I like to put on a show. Yeah, and so that kind of clicked. That like, oh, that's the reason why I was comfortable mm-hmm. in that environment. And say other guys might get really, really shy is like they're thinking about like being judged, and they're thinking about maybe like the perform like. Uh, performance in terms of like pleasing the woman Mm -hmm. whereas i'm thinking about like all right everyone in this room is going to watch me be a complete fucking stud Mm -hmm. and i don't know it's just that sent being the center of attention i'm super duper comfortable with yeah yeah and that play that was the first inkling i got of yeah maybe i could probably do this Mm -hmm. and then through that swinging scene i actually met a bunch of girls who were escorts and I actually ended up working as a straight male companion back in Australia for a number of years. So male, male escort. Yeah, yeah. So I would see like wealthy business ladies, like China. I had this one client who was like a Chinese millionaire. She would fly me out to New Zealand on skiing trips and stuff like that. Take me out to like Michelin star dinners. And then like afterwards, oh. we'd go back to the hotel room and have some fun. And it was just a lot of that. And then meeting girls in that industry, a lot of them also did pornography. Mm-hmm. So I sort of started to like hear from from multiple girls in that industry, you should try porn. You'd be pretty good at this. I heard that a few times without even thinking about it, without even sort of taking it in. But after like the third or fourth or fifth time, it finally kind of sank in. I'm like, you know, maybe I should actually give this a try. And then uh, <laughs> the way I got in was I, I had a couple that I used to, so me and him used to double team his wife occasionally good friends and uh <laughs> i filmed what i called like demo footage it was trash by the way i rented mm-hmm. like professional cameras and like lighting and stuff and i had no idea at the time what get, i was doing getting all the wrong angles dude like <laughs> cords in the <laughs> close, shot, close up of your ass shadows it was awful like looking back at it now as like what, what i know about like cameras and stuff, I'm like this is so bad yeah like, critiquing it from like a a, a film school angle but I filmed some stuff and then I broke it up into like positions and put it in a Dropbox folder. And then I, I hunted down the emails of a few directors in Melbourne and I cold pitched them by an email saying, yo, here's my background. I've been doing swinging. I've been doing escorting. I would like to try my talents in this industry. I think I'd be good. By the way, here's some demo footage mm-hmm. to prove that I can do this while someone's filming, like looking at me with a camera. And they said, this is the most professional application we have ever received. We'll give you a shot. And I flew out to Melbourne like two weeks later and shot my first porno. No way. Yeah. So I take it at that point, you were fed up of doing the escorting. Yeah, I actually was. I was. I was kind of, because... It's, it's weird because I know, I know it exists, but like, it's, I, I always wonder, is it actually like, what are the, the type of women like? that are paying for the escorts. Like, you know what? Because the, the dream would obviously be to have sex with someone who's paying you and they're really hot. 
But realistically, were, were any of them hot? You know what? I actually had a couple of escorts hire me. Mm. So girls who were professional escorts, professionally beautiful themselves, who literally just wanted a night off. Let's get I, fucked properly. They're like, I'm going to lay back and you can make me come for a change. Because they've, been, yeah, they've yeah. been sucking some dude's dick all night. So they're like, all right, let, just make me come and then I'm going to go to sleep. <laughs> and then you can leave. That was literally what they put me for. And I'm like, this is so interesting. I would have never have guessed that. Yeah. But the majority of the clients were late 30s, multiple six-figure a year, white-collar business ladies. Mm. That's the typical client. So she's like in a place in her life where the kind of men that she wants to date no longer want to date her they're going to go after the 18, 19, 21 year old. Right. Yeah. And so she, but at the same time, the guys who probably might date her, they don't meet her f financial expectations because she out earns them. Mm. So she's in a bit of a conundrum. So what she ends up doing, she's missing romance. She misses love. She misses com like that, that intimacy. She wants to feel beautiful again. So she'll hire a guy like me and I will give her, my undivided attention for that entire evening. And I will make her feel beautiful. I'll make her feel special again. I'll make her feel like the only woman on the planet. And that's what they hire you for, right? Yeah. It's not necessarily like the, the sexual side of it. It's that making her feel beautiful and young again is the real key to that business. Is it, is it legal? In Australia, it's uh, what you call decriminalized. Mm. So we're allowed to like advertise on forums and stuff like each state has like slightly different legislation, mm -hmm. but you don't go to jail for it now. It's fascinating because I, I used to get some emails back in the day when I was, when I just started Instagram, I think I was like 22, 23. And like I used to put up these pictures, but they were all like modeling pictures. So nobody knew who I was or where I came from. And people were coming across my profile. Like I was just a mystery. And then I used to get these emails from, they were women. And they were asking how much I was charging. And there was there was one I remember, but I thought it was a scam because I didn't know it existed. Right. There was there's one who I think there was like supposed to be me and like another five guys who were gonna get paid loads of money, I think like twenty thousand euros, to go to this island in the Caribbean and just spend a week with a group of older women. And I went, because at the time I was like, damn, that's, that's good money. That's some good money. Yeah. But I didn't know like <laughs> how do you even know if this is like legit? How do you know if this is a scam? Yeah. And like I, w I was honestly, I felt like, oh God, I, it could be okay, but it could be an absolute disaster. Yeah. So I ended up not doing it. Because it, you, you, it's a it's a bit, women have to be more careful than dudes do in this industry typically. Because, you know, like I'm a relatively big, relatively strong guy. Like mm. if someone is trying to pull a fast one on me, well, okay, they're going to find out really quickly that they can't do that. Mm -hmm. With a woman, it's a bit harder. A bit, uh, sorry, a bit harder harsher for her to kind of do this job you gotta have you still have to have non-disclosure agreements like a degree of detective work kind of goes into sussing out a client before you actually see them mm. so a really basic thing that i would always do is check the phone number on like all social medias just type you could type it into facebook search bar if their account is linked to that photo uh, sorry that phone number you'll see their profile. Mm -hmm. So like, oh, okay, Sarah Jane, whatever, punch her number in, bang, is it actually who she, who she says she is? Oh, it turns out it is. Turns out it's not. Like yeah. those kind of things are what you can start to do when you first get like into the industry and stuff. And they also have like, in Australia, at least they have like these forums for escorts where they have like giant client blacklists. Mm. So like this person was a dick, this person was a dick, this person was not who they said they were, this person was not who they said what they were, et cetera, et cetera. And you have this list of numbers that you black, just blacklist, basically. Yeah. yeah, they've got, for sure they've got that here. I don't know a few girls who are part of these massive WhatsApp groups between like 100, 200 girls all doing the same thing. Yep. And they all give feedback on their clients and like, don't, don't go with this guy. Yeah, yeah. It's 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 kind of, it's nice in a way that yeah. that, an industry like that, everyone is kind of banding together to protect each other, like to help each other out in a way like that. Because mm -hmm. um, you, it's the industry isn't what people think it is. Like the, I'm kind of getting off topic here, but that that the escorting side of things, 
they all really look after each other. They all band together. I remember when I was living in Melbourne, it was like there was a lot of camaraderie. This between, is between you and the, the guys or? Me and the female. Oh, you and the female. Okay, yeah, yeah. Like they considered me like one of them. Like we would go out for cocktails and stuff together. And it was kind of cool because like we were all like part-time porn stars, part-time escorts. And I'm like, yeah. and this is my first taste of the industry too. And I'm like, I'm sitting here partying with all these like these people who do this like stuff for a living. And I'm like, this is kind of cool. Yeah. Degenerate. But cool <laughs> at the same time. But look, who am I? I'm a degenerate. So who am yeah. I to judge? Yeah. So yeah, that was like the my my first kind of taste of that industry, and you know, and you 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 stopped because you just didn't like doing it anymore, or you the money wasn't good enough. The money was actually better than pornography. Oh, okay, and I but I stopped because it got exhausting pretending to love a woman. Uh yeah, right, yeah. like convincing this woman that that I love her and that she is... You, you had to pretend you loved her. I mean, I wouldn't say that. Yeah. I wouldn't. I she, never, she needed I, to feel it. She had to feel it. So I have to be present in that way. I have to be there and I have to give her exactly what she, she wants emotionally in that way. And when you don't actually feel that way about somebody... Yeah, that's heavy. It's, it's draining. And I would also be honest, like I wouldn't... I was like, I would much rather be getting paid to be with prettier women mm -hmm. you know so i thought you know what let's try out the porno side of things mm -hmm. see how i go with that and i absolutely loved it i was like yes this is okay i'm gonna keep doing this i'm gonna keep pushing this and uh yeah i ended up going to england and shooting in england and stuff like that get got in the famous fake taxi ended up shooting for brazzers out there as well um yeah and then made my way to europe and eventually made my way to america so how many years were you doing that for then five Five years. Five years shooting professional pornography all across this planet. What what would you say some of the biggest takes you got from that? Hmm. Women are very, very similar physically across the board. Mm -hmm. Like they all respond in them for the most part, they all respond to the exact same things physically. Like they all have the same buttons that you can push, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Most of them like having their hair pulled the right way. Most of them like being spanked a little bit here and there. A lot of them like to be choked in the right way, right? These are all things that turn them on and, and you know, get them wet between the, between the legs. So these are all buttons that every woman has. And they're not as diverse in what res they respond to as you might think. Yeah. So um, take me through a typical day at work when you're working in the industry. You, do you get to choose who you work with or does the the company or production company they put you together and then did they give you a script? Did they say like, oh, you have to do this position, you have to do this, you have to do this or do you just like meet the co-worker and just crack on and improvise? So the way it typically works is literally the, the maybe a day before or two days before maximum, I know who I'm shooting with. So like sometimes it's literally the night before. Mm -hmm. I like 10 o'clock at night, I'm shooting at like 8 a.m. All right, you're working with this person. All right, great. You'll get a script which has the dialogue part and it has what we call like key shots, which is kind of like they've taken a photo from another porno and they're like, we want you to try and replicate this okay. kind of position slash scenario. So you're like, all right, I'm going to try and do that. And then, yeah, you get to set... It's really a lot of paperwork. You'd be surprised how much, for the dude especially, how much of the day is just waiting around and filling out paperwork. Because you have to do like tax forms, like every single shoot, because we're, we're contractors, right? We're freelance. Mm. So it's like every day is like a tax form and then a model release and then a consent form and then this and then that. And it's just like a lot of filling out paperwork. And... I'm also waiting around for her to get her makeup done, for the camera guy to like set up the lighting and stuff like that, to get the shot right, like going over the lines. Probably like 60% of the day is spent on the like five to 10 minutes of dialogue that everyone skips through. <laughs> <laughs> the terrible acting. Excuse me, I think my <laughs> acting is fantastic. Yeah, not everyone's bad, yeah. <laughs> I actually got nominated twice for, for uh, Best Actor. So I'm not bad, I'm yeah. not terrible, but not, you know, not necessarily good, but I'm mm. not terrible. 
and kept them. it's weird because you, got, you, you, you I guess you got to have it because you can't just go straight in there. Yeah, you, you, there has to be with some, some with some companies, it's literally just like two people on a couch. Let's go. That's mm -hmm. super quick. But the most of them, at least the ones that I was working for, there's lots of dialogue, and you sort of go for all that, and it's. It's kind of a bit of a farce because you know that the average person watching this is totally skipping through yeah. all this stuff you're putting in work and effort into. I think that and because the directors put a lot of time and focus and energy into it too. Mm -hmm. I think that's for two reasons because one, they want to win an award when it comes to ABN season and they give awards out for this kind of stuff. And two, a lot of the directors come from film school. So they still have that passion in them yeah. for like making a good movie. They're like, you know, we're going to make this, the lighting's going to be perfect. We're going to make this art, artistic. We're going to, you know, we're going to cut here. We're going to cut there. We're going to get this shot, that shot. You're like, okay, yep, great, cool. When do I have to get a boner? All right, all right, all right. <laughs> we're good. Yeah, and then the last like hour, hour and a half of the day is dedicated towards the hanky-panky. It's, it's weird because obviously they put so much effort into it. But what I think is the most important thing, if I'm watching porn and like if I'm reviewing it, then what I think is most important is the chemistry between the two actors. Yes. Because if there's no chemistry, you can tell they're not enjoying it. And yep. it's just like, what, what, I don't want to watch two people have sex when they're clearly not enjoying it. It's hot when they're like, they fucking both want each other. And that about, I, I kind of broke up the industry into like thirds. So when, when there's a day like that, when me and her have amazing chemistry, it's the best job on the planet. Mm -hmm. You're like, you get to set, and it's just lightning bolts between the two of you. The moment you lock eyes, you're like, yes, all right, today's going to be a good day. You're flirting from the moment you start talking together. The whole day is just flirting, flirting, flirting. That, that sexual tension's building up. It's like, yes. And then you're just, you're just waiting to tear each other's clothes off, and you produce an amazing scene. Everyone's happy. High fives all around, and we go home. We get paid. That's like one third of the shoots you'll do as a dude. Mm. There's another third, which are uh, so I call those first th those that first third of girls I call them like the nymphomaniacs, because they're they're the women who are genuinely genuinely in the industry for the right reasons. Like yeah. they love this job. The next third are what I call the professionals, and these girls typically have like a husband or a boyfriend at home, right? So they're not really emotionally available to you mm. at all. And they will keep their kind of they'll kind of keep their distance. They'll be respectful, be very professional about things until the camera starts rolling, and then they give you their all. Mm -hmm. So there's not really that buildup of tension prior to the the camera start rolling, but then they get the job done, and it's still enjoyable, right? It's not as fun as the previous one, but it's still enjoyable. Now the last third are what make this job really really difficult, and they're the divas, and these are the girls who are like, yeah, yeah, frumpy. Mm -hmm. on their phone all day, uh, maybe rude to like the director or the camera guy or his assistant or something, uh, deliberately like late, slow to learn their lines, they're not, not taking things professionally. And when it comes to like the sex part, there's absolutely zero chemistry there. So as a male performer, you kind of have to go into a, a bit of a dark place in your head sometimes with girls like that who aren't really giving you anything because you've got to kind of, because if you can't, you know, rise to the occasion, mm -hmm. well, then no one's getting paid today. Yeah, the, yeah. The job is not getting finished, right? So, all right, in order to produce something, I've got to go somewhere in my head. And I know this is not just me because I've talked to other male performers about this. You've got to go somewhere in your head where it's kind of like, like a bit like a hate fuck. You know what I'm saying? Oh well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like a like like a pack, kind of like makeup sex. Mm -hmm. Like when you've just had an argument with your ex or something, and then you get back together, you're like, mm. like, and you. It's kind of like that energy is what you got to tap into to get the job done mm -hmm. on those days. Yeah. Um. Um. I saw, <laughs> I watched uh, one of your videos where you reviewed the performance of some of the most uh, some of the most famous stars. So if, any, if anyone's not seen that video, I think that's like your most viewed videos, nearly a million views. Did you get any backlash from that? Dude, I don't think from not a single chick. Really? Not a single No, no but, but from the, the stars themselves, did they get in touch with you? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. None oh, of them right. got in touch with me. I was like, I, when I did this, I saw I had, I've got a YouTube team. 
mm-hmm. and they they we were bouncing around some ideas and they, that's the same as the the Nico Leonard's watch review layout, isn't it, with the tables? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So they were like, hey, like, we should do this tier list thing. <laughs> and I'm like, what's this? What does this mean? I've never I'd never seen it before. Yeah. And they were like, oh, the you know, top to bottom, like you rank them and you drop them. And I'm like, this sounds like it'll get me in a lot of trouble. Mm-hmm. I don't know if I should do this. Like, this sounds super like disrespectful and like it'll totally backfire. Um and I, maybe I, I'm just not popular enough on YouTube. Maybe they like. Maybe they did. There was some backlash, and I just didn't see it. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, n- not a single one of those girls have come after me. Uh, to be fair, they like, but you know they probably watched it and they were like, "Fuck yeah, I need to, I need to step my game they, up." A they, little bit. I guarantee you, they did not. <laughs> I guarantee one hundred percent they would never do that. <laughs> <laughs> I know the personalities of these women; they would never do that. <laughs> yeah. But to be fair. A couple of the ones that I ranked really, really low, they don't like me anyway. Mm-hmm. So that's totally okay. So it's yeah. like, all right, well, she already didn't like me. It, what is this going to change, right? But uh, I tried to make that video as, you know, objective and impartial and non yeah, yeah, as I, I possibly could. You, you did it good. You did a good job. Yeah, but I knew, I knew, do like the average dude who watches porn is going to be like this is hilarious and this yeah. is like so silly yeah. let's let's dive into this thing yeah but, is it is there anything so when you know you're going to be on set the next day and you know you need to perform is there anything you will do to prepare yourself for it like in terms of whether it's like physical activity or maybe having like a tactical beforehand or eating certain foods or not eating absolutely there's a whole bunch of stuff so the night before a scene, what I'll typically do is I'll have what I call my boner shake. <laughs> so my boner shake is really simple. It's just four raw eggs and a scoop of vanilla protein powder and some water. Mm-hmm. And I blitz that up. So I've got like all the basic chemical building blocks I need to produce a ton of testosterone while I'm asleep. Mm-hmm. Like all that cholesterol, good cholesterol in me, a bunch of other stuff, right? So when I wake up, I, I call it my boner shake because if you do that, if you try that, four raw eggs... And, and go to sleep. You should wake up the next morning with a raging hard on. Chris, can you go to the shop and get some eggs, please? <laughs> <laughs> and I kind of use that as like a litmus test too for like testosterone levels. Like if I'm not waking up with a hard on, yeah. okay, maybe something I did the day before was off, right? Like I'm not getting enough sunlight and my sleep was off, my diet was off, and then I'll correct that. And it's like, okay, cool. Now we're back on track because I'm waking up with, with morning wood, right? Mm. I think guys should naturally wake up that way. Um, so bonus shake is something I definitely take the day before obviously basic stuff like getting good sleep uh, I don't I try not to uh, um, like I won't masturbate in climax or anything like that before, like the night before I'll del- in some cases I'll deliberately give myself blue balls so like either I'll see a girl and I won't finish or I'll really? just yeah I'll just deliberately like try to like but just be that, that aroused you would have thought logically thinking about it that that means that you will blow your load quicker see that has never been a problem for me you, can, you always you can control i it. can last as long as i want really never ever ever been a problem so for me it's i was always more afraid of like not being excited enough mm-hmm. that was the i guess the paranoia i had right because those are the two things it's like are you so excited that you pop super super early Mm -hmm. or are you not excited enough that you can't get a boner and in my experience on set that the the latter like not getting a boner at all means no one gets paid yeah right if i'm at least let's say hypothetically did did, did that ever happen by the way uh, i've had i've had one day where i had a like it was probably the biggest learning lessons in my entire career where i just failed miserably and it was for a director i really really respected too Mm. And I think that's probably why I was, I wasn't even nervous about the girl. It was like, is this big director? And like, oh, he's amazing. Like, if I do well with him, all these great yeah. things are going to so happen. Start getting anxious. And I just, yeah. I got so in my head. And this was sort of, this was probably about a year, about a year ish into me starting in the industry. And I'm actually incredibly grateful that it happened because it happened so early. It's so like, it, I, the timing of it. If it happened at the very, very beginning of my career, I probably would never have had a career. Mm-hmm. But I had enough runway and enough experience. So like this one bad scene, 
didn't ruin my career. And it taught me a whole bunch of lessons about like mentality and like nerves and how to manage that, how to manage expectations and what that means for like your anxiety. And all of this came from this one really shitty day on set. And there's, there is no day that is worse than like a whole room full of people with cameras and lights standing around and watching you with a floppy penis. That is a terrible day. So <laughs> I'm just, God, so that's why I, I have sympathy I can't for guys. even imagine how bad that is. But that's why I can now go to like, if some guy comes to me and he's like, hey, I'm nervous in the bed with my, my new girlfriend. I'm like, hey, I got you. Don't worry. We could fix this. <laughs> Easy. <Yeah. laughs> like, that's yeah. no, no problem yeah. <laughs> compared to what I've had to go through, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah, that was uh, that was super super interesting. And the 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 industry itself rewards the women a lot more, doesn't it? Because they get paid a lot. Like how much more than the average dude? There's there is a pay gap, and yeah. it exists only in my industry. It's the only industry where the pay gap actually exists. <laughs> they get paid. It depends on the girl, honestly. But let's say take the av in a, let's take Los Angeles, the average new dude and the average new chick. She's getting paid at, at least three times what he's getting paid. At least. Mm -hmm. Yeah. At least three X. Yeah. And you get paid basically per, per shoot. Yeah. Yeah. Per pop, basically. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if, you get, if, you're, if you're a young 18-year-old dude, you can do two scenes a day. Good for you. Yeah. Go knock it out of the park. Some, and some dudes will do that. They'll do that. They'll do two scenes a day, 30 days a month for like the first year. And it'll just crush it. Absolutely crush it. But then that starts to like, eventually that starts to wear on them a little bit. Mm -hmm. And they've got to kind of slow down. As, because if they're cranking out that many scenes a day too, what they tend to do is they tend to take a ton of like Viagra or a ton of Cialis. And your body, this is something people don't really understand about these drugs, is your body can develop a drug immunity, like yeah. a resistant, a drug resistance, sorry, to that active compound. So, if I'm taking Viagra like every day for like months, eventually I have to up the dosage to get the same effect. Mm -hmm. And then eventually I have to up the dosage again and again. And so at some point, it doesn't do anything at all. And your heart's just getting battered every time. Bro, like I've been on set where like, like because um, they'll t always test out new kids, not kids, but new guys on um, like a blow bang or a gang bang shoot mm -hmm. so it's like one chick and like 10 dudes they suck it's the worst shoot ever it sucks you just sit you're standing around there's like a bunch of man ass you're trying to catch a glimpse of like a tit <laughs> it's just awful but i've been on sets like that and there'll be like some new kid and his face is like bright red and <laughs> he's, he's furiously trying to get a boner and he can't because the thing people don't tell you about Viagra or Cialis is it doesn't give you an erection. It maintains one. It keeps it there. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a blood flow thing. Mm -hmm. It's not an arousal thing. right? Mm -hmm. This is what actually gives you a boner in the first place. That, that feeling of arousal, right? that mm -hmm. sensation. And if you, you can pop as many Viagra as you want, as much Cialis as you want. If you are nervous, if you have anxiety, you are, in, you are not getting an erection. And I'm just, it's you just see it all the time in the porn industry and so yeah what's what happens is some guys they'll they'll take viagra forever or cialis forever the drug stops working and then eventually they have to take something even stronger which in our industry is is a thing called the uh it's called cavaject i don't know if you've ever heard of this thing it's horrifying so it's basically a needle that you inject into the penis no joke and it gives you like forces a like three hour erection wow it was just like injection and then poof, bang, like, and it ain't going away. Sounds really healthy. Dude, some dudes <laughs> go to the hospital because of that shit. Like they'll literally, they'll, they'll, they'll do an injection and they'll go shoot a scene and then it, they'll finish and it ain't going down. And they're looking at the clock and it's like, well, that's been there for like five hours. I should probably go to the hospital. They're starting to like, start to hurt. Mm -hmm. Like I should probably go to the hospital, they end up having to get a catheter and like get it drained. It's, awful awful and then here's the best part then if they keep doing that for years eventually that stops working too mm. and then they have to get what i call the robo dick and the robo dick 
is where they literally hollow out the penile shaft and they insert an inflatable like apparatus in there. <laughs> and it's like, remember those Nike pumps? Those those shoes with the pump, right? <laughs> That's your testicle now. So they, they put a, a, it's either in the testicle or somewhere else in the body. They put this pump and you press it and the no way. Legit. Yeah, it inflates. And then you can def and then you press it again, you deflate, and they deflate. <laughs> Surely at that point you have to realize that you've got a bit of a problem if you're taking it to that level. Well, think about think about the kind of guy that has to has to do that, right? So he's done, let's say he's followed that exact path I just described, right? He's, mm. he's young and he's doing Viagra all the time. Cool, that stops working. Then he's in his twenty mid twenties. Now he's taking the needle all the time. And then that stops working eventually. He's been in the industry, and this I know this for a fact because I, I kind of it's a sort of hidden secret who has the pump, the magical like Robo Dick pump because mm -hmm. like the girls have some inkling, but they can't actually completely tell if a dude has it or not. And then like the dudes behind everyone's back are like, "Yo, does so and so have it? Does so and so have it? like we're all trying to figure out which of these dudes have it because we're all like trying to win awards and yeah, it's yeah. like super unfair if this guy has it like a Robo Dick." And I'm I'm working with like my God given natural penis. Yeah. And we're we're competing for the same male performer of the year award. I'm like son of a bitch. I can't compete with that. Yeah. But the kind of guy who kind of has to get that, they tend to be like ten, 20, like plus year veterans of the industry because that's all they've been doing their whole life is that same job. They didn't. They never branched out and got another skill at all. They didn't even try to become a director. They didn't even sort of step back like on the other side of the camera. And so, all right, 10, 15 years later, that's all they can do. They've got to pay the bills. All right, what's the next step? All right, they get the robo dick. Yeah, because at that point, if you're going well into your 40s and 50s or whatever, your natural testosterone level is going to drop. You're not going to be performing like you were back in the day, back in your prime. Yeah. So, I mean, I and I got into this industry when I was like 29, so mm -hmm. I got into it at like, at like a relatively late age, mm -hmm. you know. So, and now I've stepped away from it, and I've, you know, I'm I'm blessed to be able to sort of take that experience, that unique sort of time under pressure, and apply the lessons I've learned to help the average dude improve his sex life. Yeah, well, and, I could tell you, you're you're very articulate and you're smart. Thank you. But I imagine a lot of guys were doing it. Maybe they're doing it because they didn't really have any other options. You know, you'd think that, but there's a lot of dudes who are super, super smart in okay. our industry. Like a lot of, uh, I, I wish I'd like find patents. And the patent, there was a bunch of patents I noticed when I started like looking back and analyzing like, okay, all the different male performers. And there's a bunch of dudes who are like ex-collegiate athletes, mm -hmm. right? And there's a bunch of dudes who do boxing, who are like, maybe not like, necessarily professional or even amateur but like they were, were always involved in like combat sport like boxing or jujitsu that was always part of their life so they like all those around like it ran high testosterone environments and competitive environments and athletic environments super consistent across dudes who go into the industry and they're naturally fit naturally fit yeah great cardiovascular system great testosterone levels okay these two things play hand in hand and to be able to do the job really who would you Rate, in your opinion, doesn't have to be present. Anyone in the past, the GOAT female star and the GOAT male star. The GOAT male would have to be Rocco Sofridi. Oh, yeah. He's <laughs> the, the best that there has ever been. You know, he was the guy who, he was the, him and, uh, was it John Stagliano, I think? It was him and whoever he partnered with were the first people to ever use like a handy cam and do oh, like okay. a point of view. Mm -hmm. Point, they were the, he was the guy who started that whole thing mm -hmm. in like, what, the 80s, 90s when the handicams came out. He is loaded. He is a multi, multi-millionaire. Really? Yeah, Rocco's, I've been to his property in uh, Budapest. The, from what? Just the... From that. Dude, like... So he got so famous that like he was able to charge a, like a high rate or is he people, selling something off? People made a lot more money in pornography in like prior to Pornhub. Mm. They made so much more because you can get it online for free. Yeah. Yeah. So like like people were selling DVDs and shit. Like they, they were all these things were like making money. Like they would nowadays the let's let's I can, I can go to like the economics of porn if you want. Yeah. If that's if that's yeah. interesting to you. Yeah. So like let's break down the average 
what what the average porno would cost to produce today. Uh, just run on the mill average. The chick is probably costing you a grand, like the, the female actress. The male actor is probably costing you like five hundred bucks. The PA is probably costing like an assistant is probably costing you two hundred or three hundred bucks. The venue itself, like the the rent, like the space, the apartment or whatever you're shooting in. For the day, probably because you'll probably shoot two scenes in a day, so you'll divide that cost in two. For the day, it's probably like six hundred bucks. So let's say three hundred bucks there. So we're up to now. Like that's one grand, five hundred, three hundred, three hundred. Cool, two thousand one hundred there. Then the director has to make his cut, which is probably only going to be like five hundred bucks. So you're looking at two thousand six hundred. Makeup artist, she's probably another couple hundred at least. That's 2,800. What else we got? Yeah. Let's let's just say, for like argument's sake, about three grand mm-hmm. to produce one porno that is going to be going to end up for free on Pornhub within like a month. Yeah. So like the company has to has to make their money back from that somehow. And the way they do that the, these days is with they used to do it through like DVDs and like cinema and like actually having like adult cinemas and stuff. There was. They made a lot more margins that way because they couldn't. They didn't have to produce as much content as well. Now they have to crank out like the average subscription site is probably cranking out something like four, yeah, about, about twelve scenes a month minimum, mm-hmm. right? So that's like thirty six thousand dollars in terms of like just produce the content that they're putting on their pay site, which somebody is paying maybe thirty dollars a month subscription for. Right, so you think about that, but the way it works, people people are like, how the hell are, is anyone making any money in pornography? It's pure volume. Like the most trafficked websites on the planet are like Pornhub, X Videos, X Hamster, Red Tube. These sites they get the most traffic on the planet. It's just endless, endless eyeballs. And and if you throw enough people at a funnel, at a sales funnel, someone's clicking eventually. Yeah. Like there's enough people on the planet that eventually people will click and subscribe. And the, there's a lot, a lot of teasers on there where they don't show the good bit. They don't show the climax. Yep. If you want to see the climax, go pay for that. Exactly. Right. And that whole ecosystem is actually very clever. So you've got, because the people, I don't know if you know this, the people who, let's say, for example, Pornhub, the people who own Pornhub is a, a parent company called MindGeek, a Canadian company. So they own Pornhub. They also own about eight other what we call tube sites like that. So like Red Tube, uh, X Hamster, I think, like a few, let's say a few variants like that. They own about eight of these sites. Millions of, mi- billions of hours probably of content on these websites, right? And constantly being updated every day. Now this parent company, MindGeek, they own them, but they also own some of the biggest studios on the planet, like Brazzers, for example. Would you, is, that, is that the biggest in the game, would you say? They're number one, yeah. They are yeah. the, hands down, the biggest. Yeah. They've been around for a while, haven't they? Yeah. 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 And, they've, and they've changed quite, they've kind of changed their their style a lot from when they first started. Now they're, they're more kind of goofy and funny. Like the people, if you go to any of these websites, you'll often see like these, what we call um, like ad reels, these GIFs that play on the side of the video. And it's just this, you know, some woman getting a, getting stuck in like a washing machine or something like that, these stupid things, that's kind of what they pioneered, mm-hmm. that ridiculousness of, that ridiculous style of uh, adult entertainment. So this, this one company owns all that, and they get, and by the way, they get paid for all the ad revenue they generate on those websites, because people are selling, you know, dick pills and, and uh, sign up. These, like, these are ads which will pop up on the video. The free video. The free video, yeah. Right, all the ads that pop up on the free videos with this free porn, right? Nothing's free. Like, if it's free, you're the cons- you're the product, yeah, right. So your eyeballs are getting shoved all these different ads for maybe it's for dick pills, maybe it's for like webcam signups, dating apps signups, all these things. And there's a whole universe of affiliate marketers who make a ton of money off that alone. Like I knew a guy, he was spending, I think he was spending forty thousand US a day on paid ads. On like Pornhub, and he was turning, he was making a hell of a lot more than that on the back end in terms of profit. And that just, that's just, and he was a small player, right? Gives you an idea of like how much revenue they're making in terms of ad spend. 
So then they also own some of these bigger studios, right? So the the whole, no matter what people do, the big company, MindGeek, is making money. Okay, they watch a free, uh, a free reel or whatever of a video. Great, they make some ad revenue. They come down further down the chain. They click on one of these. Oh, free uh, like one dollar. Sign up for one dollar for thirty days or whatever. One dollar. They do this all the time. One dollar trial for like three days on browsers. Right. You click that. You're in their funnel. Here's the cheeky thing. That one. If you don't cancel that one dollar within like th- uh, sorry. If you don't cancel that three day trial before it clicks over after three days, it char- it bills at like twenty nine ninety nine a month. Mm-hmm. And the way they set this whole ecosystem up is that they they deliberately, the website will deliberately not have, like say browsers, right? Will deliberately not have a way for you to cancel your membership on your member login. You have to go to like the billing company oh. to actually cancel it. So it become it, it just creates this extra hurdle for the customer to cancel their membership, right? So for a start, they're doing it, they're probably signed up when they're horny, yeah, probably. And then they jerked off and they forgot they signed up or they forgot when they signed up. And so three days passes, bang, $29. Okay, they got them for that first one. Then he remembers and he goes to try and cancel the damn thing and he can't figure out how to cancel it because it was like when he signed up, he got like an email from some completely vague sounding company that's like where he actually has to go to cancel his his billing membership. Mm -hmm. So he can't figure it out. He's frustrated. Bang, another month goes by. They got him for two already. Eventually, he figures it out and he tries to cancel it. Okay, maybe they're going for three. But that's that just got like 30, 60, 90 bucks out of the dude, right? That hap- Think about how many times a day that is happening. Yeah, yeah. And you get an idea of how much revenue these companies can generate. Like I know a friend back in LA. He runs a very, very niche uh, fetish website. Super niche. Like uh, he's pulling in about $100,000 US a month now. It's not. It's not shop so, so That's good. Not, and he's probably his overheads are probably twenty five k a month, probably. Yeah. So he's doing all right. Yeah. Like the, people make money in this industry still. Was this something but, you ever thought about getting into? I have thought about like uh, taking that step back and running like a, a few niche sites. It would never be under like my name. Yeah. So you would never know it's me. Or maybe I already have one. But. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. But that there there is definitely money to be made in that industry yeah. if you know what. But the did, would you say it's easy for newcomers to get into the industry? It's quite hard. Super against, hard. Yeah, super hard. The hard part about like say run, running a successful, profitable site like that, right, is knowing knowing the people in the industry because this you can't Google this stuff. Yeah. Right. You can't you can't figure out. You need to know who the who the agents in the industry are. Because they have all the talent that you want to hire, right? So you have to go through the agent to get the talent. So are, they, the are they are they hard to find because Google is restricting their visibility, or they just don't want to be that they're under a not, different alias? Not all of them. Like some of them don't even have like websites. Yeah, you know, like it's it's literally connections that people make through Twitter and through going to industry events and doing it all face to face. It's a it's a, the whole industry is very much based around like face to face meets, like. The other side of that industry, of, of that, uh, of say wanting to create a, a pay site, right? The other side of the problem is, okay, where do you get the traffic from? How do you get, how do you drive all this traffic to your website? And you do that through affiliates. Okay, well, who do you know who's like a, a expert at uh, adult traffic, adult affiliate traffic? It's very, very hard to find these guys. They all hang out at certain conferences, but you have to know which conferences they go to, mm. you know? And so you have to really tap into this entire ecosystem to even figure out where to start. To have, have a chance at even like cr- starting, because I've seen people who are like hobbyists try to start websites, and I can t- you can just tell that they're doing really badly. Like they're not making it's like it's it's like it's like charity. Yeah, like they're not making any money because they don't know the the engine behind the scenes that really makes the money, which is the affiliate marketing side of the adult industry, mm-hmm. and. There's like a handful of players in that industry who are extremely good at what they do. And then everyone else just doesn't get any traffic. Yeah. So you you spent, what did you say, five years doing that? Doing doing the porno stuff. Yeah. And then at what point did you think, all right, it's time to leave? You know what? It wasn't I wasn't even thinking about leaving. It was just COVID hit. Oh. Because yeah. we had to sh- we had to stop shooting. Damn. All right. We figured it out pretty quickly though. 
the adult industry was probably the far, the, one of the first industries to go straight back to work, <laughs> which I found hilarious. Like, you ain't stopping us from fucking. Like, we're <laughs> going to figure this out, like, straight away. I mean, to be fair, we already did, like, we get tested for STDs every two weeks. Yeah. So we're already getting blood samples drawn and urine samples done every two weeks. And then they're like, all right, why don't we just add, like, like a nose swab or a throat swab or whatever to, like, the panel. And like, all right, cool. Within, like, a month and a half, we were all back shooting again. But... I had already started like writing my first book probably six months prior to that. And it was sort of this, this thing I'll, on the weekend, I'd, I'd you know, duck off to the study and I'd write like a thousand words here and there. Right? And then COVID hit and I'm like, hmm, I haven't got any money coming in. I need to, I should probably publish this thing that yeah. I've been sitting here like thinking about for ages. So I f- finished that thing up, put out my first book and within like a couple of months, I was making more in a week from that than I was making in a month from porno. What's the name of the book? Well, my first book is called How I Grew My Penis and Other Porn and Industry Secrets. That's the, it's a catchy title. It's a very good title. <laughs> I, thank you very much. I thought it was pretty good. <laughs> so, yeah, and it, it did extremely well. And then I just, I just started connecting with the right people. Uh, I mean, you might know some of the guys I've hung out. I, I've connected with like Rollo Tomasi, a few, mm-hmm. uh, Richard Cooper, a few of these other guys in, in what you would call like the Manosphere space. Mm-hmm. And uh, they had me on their shows and we had a great, great time talking about kind of exactly what we're talking about now. And that got more eyeballs on me. And then they recommended that I start my own YouTube channel. And I thought, all right, cool. Um, I can talk to a camera. I can do that. And then I basically just started giving out as much free advice as I possibly could on my YouTube. And yeah, the rest is kind of history. That just catapulted me away from Mm -hmm. trading my time for money on set every day. But I, I would I would imagine I was thinking about this when I was looking at your videos. They're obviously quite explicit. They're not. They're all going to be age restricted. Yeah, I don't like, make. I make zero yeah, dollars. You can't, for you can't monetize anything, so that's yeah. annoying. But second of all, because of that, the, the, those videos are never going to be pushed. Like the, you'd be surprised. I was, okay, they do get it, because there's there's kind of two ways that people can find a video on YouTube. Right? There's they're literally typing something in a search bar. So they're looking for some specific information or they're scrolling through the, the homepage feed and a thumbnail kind of catches their attention mm. because it's like clickbaity. Yeah. Right. So on my channel, I try to, I try to dabble in a little bit of both. Mm-hmm. And when people are, people can search for, th- for really specific things on YouTube with that. And it won't get like completely banned from the search. Like, like how to make a girl squirt. Mm-hmm. Like, do I have chlamydia? Like stuff like this, you can you can put videos about that, educational content about that, and it doesn't get uh, yeah. taken down. I've had some things take like take. I've had a few strikes here and there. Um, actually, I actually made a that video we were talking about where I ranked. Yeah. Once I, was, I made a part three, and it got taken down within like a week. It was doing really well. Why, why was that though? I don't know. They, they they left parts one and two up, so we'll just leave it at that. Yeah, it's weird. I mean, I've I've had some. Um... Videos demonetized, age restricted. But there's no real explanation why. There never is. And the same thing. I mean, you must get it on Instagram as well. Yeah, you get things reported. In fact, I was searching for you today, and you don't. Like, you know, I got taken down yesterday. You got taken down. Yeah. Any explanation? No. We'll see. I might. I'm, I. We'll see. In about 24 hours, I'll know if I get it back. I've got another way of getting it back, but we'll see. I'm sure like, you know people, but yeah, I might know people will do. Yeah, but that's annoying. Yeah, like it it's, it's your business. Like surely, if you. If you lose your Instagram and you lose your YouTube, like how are you able to then reach people? Well, I so my strategy for that is to have my own email list. Mm-hmm. So I, if you own your your email list, then you, it's yeah. that degree of protection, right? Yeah. So the, my strategy, at least for my entire business, is to get everyone onto my email list. Mm-hmm. If I get you on my email list, I'll always be able to contact you. And I'll and okay, let's say my Instagram gets taken down. All right, I've got a new Instagram. I will email that entire list of people to go follow that new Instagram. And okay, within a, a week or two, it's back to a healthy level. Yeah. Like the, the audience just doesn't completely disappear. And you think about that, like the people that are going to be on my email list, they're probably my most loyal followers and subscribers, probably. Like they're definitely, all my customers are definitely on that list. So it's a very, very useful tool for me to maintain and grow in my business. So I look at, that's the metric that I look at above everything else in my entire business. It's that. I don't look at, I don't necessarily look at like followers because it's a bit of a vanity, vanity metric sometimes, and even views on videos sometimes can be a 
a bit of a vanity metric. Yes. As long as the number of email subscribers I have goes up, happy days. Because these are the people who want to find out more information. They want to subscribe to my newsletter, learn some more stuff, get updates about videos. Cool. That's the kind of guy I want. Do you know what your your audience split is between like male and female? I'd imagine it's oh, most. Dude, it's like old. It's like ninety nine men. Yeah. There are some. I'm, I'm actually surprised. There actually are some women yeah. in my audience, especially especially this last six months. I've got a lot more women. Mm -hmm. particularly on my YouTube. But uh, do you think that's because you you done a few guests Q and A's yeah. with women? It's because I think it's because of of going on shows like Fresh and Fit. Yeah. A few times. I think it's because I've done a couple of videos. Uh, aimed specifically like at women, which I thought would, would be an interesting topic to talk about. Like um was mistakes women are making that turn Well I think I did, I did one on um like here's the reason these are the reasons why he's not like calling you back. Okay. Like what men won't actually tell you, but like look, here's honest to God's truth. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe you weren't you were a catfish and you like okay, I'm not calling her back. You know, I kinda like called I kinda made a video about calling out all these things. So that, but still, ninety nine percent dudes. Yeah, and so so you have these people. Are they, how are you getting? How are you monetizing them? Are they like asking to speak to you and have like consultations? So I have a I have a, a variety of different info products I sell. Mm. Uh, I've, at this point, I've got like four books and two different video courses, and I try to cover every different problem that I have had people asking me about. In regards to sex, so I have a whole I have a whole book on performance anxiety. I have a whole book on premature ejaculation and how to prevent that. I have an entire course on how to be more dominant in the bedroom and how to kind of how to be how to get into the BDSM side of things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, I have a whole course on dirty talk, so I, I try to cover as many bases as I can. And uh, yeah, this is, this it's, is how I make it's pretty crazy because you, men aren't really taught. They're not taught how to perform in the bedroom. No. And it's actually really important because you can't satisfy your partner. She's going to start looking elsewhere. Dude, sex and relationships are the only things on this planet that men are expected to be good at without any mm. knowledge or education about it. That's it. We're just expected to be yeah. good at it. And I, I personally think that's kind of unfair on dudes, especially now in the day and age we live in right now like what you might call the Instagram age, the smartphone age, the TikTok age, where attention spans are super, super low. And I mean, you probably know this better than anyone. Like the dudes on, the guys who have a really good Instagram profile, for example, the what we might say like the top 10% of men are getting attention from like 90% of the women. Yeah. So the average guy, okay, he can't, it's really, really hard for him to get a date. So it's really, really hard for him to get a lot of sexual experience. So it's hard for him to build up this skill set in the first place. So what's he going to do, right? So I try to give guys that like advantage of like, okay, look, download my brain into yours. And now you can kind of look like a dude who's got a lot more experience than he actually has. And, you know, she'll be impressed and blown away. And then happy days. Like you now have a girlfriend who's obsessed with your penis and she's having a great time too. Like everyone wins. What is the most common question or questions that men ask you? It's probably how can I last longer mm. in the bedroom? Yeah. How do I stop myself from popping early? And like I mentioned before, that was that was never actually a problem that I had to solve. So what I had to do to actually figure out how to how to fix this problem for a lot of guys, I had to dive into, you know, the scientific literature. So I actually have a science background. If you didn't know that, I have a I have a degree in chemistry, so I have really That's yeah cool. yeah got, got a double degree in chemistry, so I know, I know how to like read a read a scientific article and tell if it's bullshit or like okay is this study peer reviewed is it is it double blind controlled trial what's going on here, um so I always try to dive into as much scientific literature as I can to back up anything I prescribe dudes in terms of like okay do this thing do that thing, and with preventing like premature ejaculation. I had to combine that with like I really had to go back in time and be like what what habits did I do I have or did I cultivate at a like at, in my teens when I started having sex what was I doing that allowed me to develop that level of control and it's 
And it was really fun, like kind of reverse engineering that process and figuring out like how the pelvic how the pelvic floor works, how like different types of Kegel exercises work for dudes. Like there's not just like one type of Kegel exercise, there's different types of Kegel exercises. And it's like there's different ways to like keep your pelvic floor balanced. And if it's too tight and too tense, you'll you'll lose control and you'll you'll prematurely ejaculate. And how that relates to like breath work and controlling your breathing during sex and all kinds there's, of stuff. There's like that. a lot to it then. Dude, I've but but it's there's a lot to it if you're trying to fix it. Yeah. I mean, like there's a lot of things you can do to fix it. It's not that complicated. Um, and I've I've had guys who've gone like who are popping in like a minute or whatever, and they're they're lasting like a couple of hours, like within like a week. And like and getting like no, nothing will make you your day better than getting an email from like some 20 year old dude who's like, bro, like I would like this this situation sucked mm -hmm. like a week ago. I took your advice and now I just rocked my girl's world. Thank you so much. Like they're so happy. And like every time I read that email in the morning, I'm like, yes, like yeah. got another win, you know? It's freaking awesome. That's that's crazy. Um I, I feel like from from me and my experience, I like you said before, women are different, but the same things kind of turn them on. And I think I was fortunate enough to be in this situation that I've been in social media the way I look. I've learned a lot from experience, but there's a lot of guys who just don't, they, they don't have access to that experience, so they can't improve. Yeah. What what steps, first of all, can they take? You've already mentioned lasting longer. How can they try to understand what it is that the woman likes or what turns them on? Do you think communication is essential or is there a way to understand or uh, before you even have that conversation, you just know, or oh, this, this type of girl, like this is what she likes. You know what? The f whenever I ask a woman this question, like, okay, what what do you think is an essential in the bedroom, right? Mm -hmm. If I ask a, if it's like a female porn star this question, the first words out of their mouth will be the word communication. Okay, what does that even mean? Yeah. It's such a vague thing. And unfortunately, I think when women... I, my personal take on this is that when women say communication in the bedroom, what they actually mean is read my body language. They don't mean let's sit down and have a conversation about this. Let's because I've been, I've done exactly that on porn sets when you're doing when you're doing a shoot for say like a, a BDSM shoot, right? We have to sit down and go over a checklist, mm -hmm. and there is nothing that ruins the mood faster than sitting down and going over a list of things like we can do and can't do to each other. It just takes away all the mystery, all the the learning, the discovery process. That that is just poof, it's gone. So so where's there's no like anticipation and and build up of sexual tension because we already know exactly what's going to happen. Yeah. Right. So when it comes to communication, my take for guys is okay. Learn to read her physical cues and her body language so that you know. Like you're not gonna step across a line that she doesn't want you to step across, mm -hmm. right? So there's a couple of things. I'll get. I'll give you a really concrete example, right? Let's say, how can a guy tell if a woman likes to be choked, for example, consensually, erotically in the bedroom, choked? Well, for a start, uh, I'll I'll teach him how to do it properly. So you don't want to apply pressure to like the the windpipe. You don't want to crush a girl's windpipe. That's a terrible idea. Bad no no. Mm -hmm. You, when you when you choke a girl, you want to go from the sides, so like here. It's actually a, the the erotic part of choking a girl is actually about cutting off blood flow. It's got nothing to do with like air restriction. So you you keep pressure away from the windpipe and you're applying it to the sides of the neck there, so you restrict the blood flow, get that kind of lightheadedness, which is what is the arousing part. So that's the first thing. Second thing, okay, how can a guy tell if a woman is actually into that at all in the first place? Well, the kind of baby step progression I'll give a guy is. Just place your hand here. Just place it there at the base of the base of the neck. Like, don't go for the neck. Just place the hand there, mm. and then observe her body. This is during the act of sex, right? You're not just doing that and standing there. This is while you're penetrating her or whatever. But seeing how she reacts to that first, does she tense up? If just by placing your hand down there and she tenses up, that's a pretty clear indication that. She one, she doesn't want you to go anywhere near her neck, 
and two, that she probably had some kind of past traumatic experience based around that as well. Very, very likely, right? However, if you put your hand there and she starts to like, she grabs your hand and either pushes it up a little bit or she like squeezes your hand a little bit like that or she just gets a smile on her face. Okay, now we can progress the hand to just resting it on the neck and then same situation, observing her body language. Mm -hmm. Does she tense up? Does she get a smile on her face? Does she proactively push her neck into your hand more? Well, that might be a pretty green signal for you to start to squeeze a little bit and again, observe her reaction to it, right? And these are all things that, this is what this is what I would say good communication in the bedroom is, is a man's ability to read her body language and to make sure he's not stepping across a line that she doesn't want him to, whilst at the same time, giving her the experience that she wants of having a man who just gets it. Yeah. Because they all want a guy who knows exactly what he's doing. Yeah, that's why a lot of girls don't want younger guys. Like They actually want a man with a bit of experience. No one's, right. no, Very few women want to have sex with a virgin. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly, right? But, okay, and all those things, all the things I just demonstrated, right? Yeah. That is a clear sign that I have done this before, that I have been with women who have been into this, and I know, and I've probably been with women who have not been into that, so I know where, where to stop. Yeah. It, it actually subcommunicates a lot of stuff to that girl that is reassuring to her. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, that's, that's actually reassuring of her safety. She knows that she can explore, you know, maybe more uh, physically aggressive, dominant things in the bedroom, but she's going to be totally safe with me. Yeah. Because I'm not just... And because I'm doing it confidently too. That's another big part, is guys will be worried about being, say, more dominant or more aggressive, more hands-on in the bedroom. But they, you definitely can't be that way if you're, if you're timid and you're questioning yeah, you yourself. you can't go yeah. half, half into it. Yeah, you can't half step, right? You have to do it with confidence. Because if, if you don't have confidence in doing when you're doing it, she sure as hell ain't going to have confidence. You should be scared. Yeah. Right? Like, oh, can, can, I, can I put my hand? Like, no. Like, yeah. you know, that's, that's the worst thing. You're actually not helping her by being timid by being uh, um, self-conscious like that. You are helping her to have more trust in you and to feel more safe by doing these things confidently and with assurance. Yeah. yeah. And that's why the, the, the communication thing can sometimes not work if you're trying to do it verbally because yeah. you could be, which has happened with me before, you could be with a woman who's maybe only had two relationships before. And the guys she's been in a relationship with are realistically not fucked up properly. So then when you come along and you you show her these things she's never experienced before, she could actually go from a, a girl who was never really that bothered about having sex and then she automatically just becomes obsessed. She wants it all the time. Yeah. She's like, what is happening to me? Yeah, and I, and I think that's that's something that's, that's a great gift to give a woman. It's yeah. like opening up aspects of her sexuality that she didn't even know she had mm -hmm. and she can now enjoy, you know? And like, let's take for an example, like anal sex, right? Mm -hmm. A lot of girls have had a terrible first experience with butt stuff. Probably because some jackass didn't know what the hell he was doing, didn't lube up, just rammed it in there and hurt her. Yeah. Right? So she has a very negative connotation towards that. But women can climax from anal sex. It can be an extremely pleasurable experience for them if it's done correctly. So that's another thing I'll teach guys. Is like, okay, he's like loop the hell up, go super, super duper slow, Be also be stupidly rock hard, as hard as you can possibly be, is actually more comfortable for her than if you're kind of soft. And like, and be super duper patient with it and let her like relax around your mm -hmm. Johnson as, as you're going in, right? And stimulate her elsewhere simultaneously. Now we're, we're creating this experience which is completely very pleasurable and enjoyable for her rather than one, so she, okay, so now you've opened that aspect of her sexuality up so she can enjoy that whereas before she thought it was this like a complete no-go and it was a horrible experience because the uh, just because the dude was a jackass yeah you know but you're absolutely right like yeah some women have had very vanilla lovers very vanilla past boyfriends or exes or whatever and so they've never really explored a lot of things but a lot of women share 
the same kind of fantasies, sexual fantasies. And, and for the most part, most women's sexual fantasies tend to revolve around the idea of being taken in some way by a man, like being ravaged passionately. Right? They want to be dominated. They want to be dominated, right? And how can a guy who's inexperienced, you know, young, inexperienced, properly dominate oh, a girl? Yeah, I'm not confident. He's he's got to have assurance and what he, he's got to have some assurance in what he's doing. You know, he's got to do it with balls. He's got to do it with confidence. And by learning, okay, well, you shouldn't do, you shouldn't choke a girl this way. You should choke a girl this way, right? Or here's the proper way to pull a girl's hair. So you don't. So it's 100 percent enjoyable, and you're not likely to like hurt her at all, right? By giving a guy those tools in his tool bag. He can then go into the bedroom and execute with confidence and be that dominant guy that he didn't think he could be before. Yeah. And it can open and as I think as a as a man, it's it's just it's part of who we are to be that more dominant one in the relationship. And I think this the bedroom is like a microcosm of the relationship as a whole outside of it. If if you're sex life with your partner is one where you're the, the guy's being dominant she's being submissive and you know it, those two are fully engaged in those roles typically outside of the bedroom there's a bit of harmony right mm -hmm. she's not nagging talking back telling him to take out the trash if she's been getting dicked down properly she's she's lovely yeah she's she's yeah. friendly she's bubbly she's compliant she's happy she's giving him a massage cooking for him cleaning like welcoming guests being a lovely hostess like it all translates across yeah. from the bedroom to the relationship in my opinion and because I've I've had guys who've been in like 20 30 year marriages and stuff they've taken some of my advice they've fixed things in the bedroom and magically the relationship is back on track again it's like it's like we're in our honeymoon again yeah because like she's getting dicked down right yeah like, yeah, if, if she's not coming, then she's going to be borderline pissed off with you. <laughs> like, you just like roll over and be like, oh, that was good, good night. And then she's just there like... Not to say that guys can't be selfish occasionally. I don't want guys to think that like, you have to be, you all you always have to be, you know, kind of performing like this. Well, I think I've noticed as I've got older and I've improved in my status and my income and everything else, I know I don't need to. Yes. <laughs> yes, exactly. I right? can afford to be selfish. You can afford to be selfish, right? But let's say a guy who isn't as well off as you, yeah. right? Maybe he can't afford to be as selfish. He's got to make an impact. He's got to make up for it somewhere, mm. right? And this is something that every dude can learn. Every dude has, we've all got a cock and balls. We can all do this. So like, it's another like way for you to kind of add value to yourself mm -hmm. in the whole. Like, you got You got your... Your physical fitness, you got your wealth, your overall health, your network. Okay, like how do you have the gift of the gab? Like are you a smooth talker, you're a charming guy? All right, and now you've also got the bedroom aspect where you can get the job done, you know, and it can help kind of even the playing field a little bit to the to the guy who's maybe not doing so well on the other areas. Yeah. Do you think let's take two scenarios. So either the male or the female has a super high sex drive and they want to have sex all the time, but their partner doesn't. Either it's normal or they just have a low sex drive. Do you think those couples are compatible or do you think they're better off, say for example, someone with a super high sex drive, they should be with somebody else who has a super high sex drive and they can just go off and have sex all day every day? Yeah, I think, let's, uh, I'll give you an alternative scenario. If it is, if it's the dude who has a super high sex drive and his, his uh, female partner doesn't have a super high sex drive, I would probably think that she doesn't actually love him or respect him that much. Mm -hmm. Because if a woman loves a man and she really respects him, she wants to please him. Even if she's, she might not have a super high sex drive in the, in the sense of like she wants to initiate sex all the time. Mm -hmm. But if she loves him and respects him and finds him genuinely attractive, when he initiates with her, she'll, she'll enjoy it and she'll want it, right? Because she wants to be chased. Yeah. Now, the uh, like... The other way around of like the girl having a super high sex drive and the guy not having a super high sex drive. This is typically a couple of different things. Either he's he could be very bored of her. Mm -hmm. This is entirely possible. He could actually just be bored of her, or he could 
be like his health could be completely out of whack. So his T levels are tr of trash, right? His sex drive's completely gone. He sleeps off, his everything's off, and that's leading to him having a low sex drive, right? I would say, and this might sound a bit odd, but in the circumstance where he is extremely, let's say he's not, he hasn't got a high sex drive with her in particular because he's bored. I actually think that him stepping out and having a bit of strange on the side, like having seeing like having a, a friend with benefits on the side or you know a side chick, can actually yeah, help it, to, it, to it, spice that up again. It works. It works, right? Even just going to a strip club and and just getting rubbed on by a bunch of different chicks, you'll that dude will probably come back home to that to his main girl, and all of a sudden he's raring to go again. Mm -hmm. Just because he's got that little bit of novelty in his system. If if it's a mo purely monogamous relationship, it does not surprise me at all that dudes end up like less horny, less aroused, like less aroused by their partner. Because guys just need variety. It's like in our blood. We, yeah, it's we, in the we need DNA. It. We need to spread the seed. Yeah. So I, I think the more women understand that, mm -hmm. the more harmony there can be between the sexes because. Men and women don't have sex for the same reasons. We don't, we don't cheat for the same reasons. We don't love the same way. So, you know, women have this kind of paranoia about like, especially if they really love a man, about like being replaced. Yeah. You know, like, and being embarrassed. That's another, that's a big one. They don't want to be embarrassed. That's a big, big thing by like their man, like stepping out and being with another woman. If, the, if you can alleviate that aspect of it, then she can start to come to terms with it and accept that yeah. it's, it's okay he's coming back he's always going to come back to me and okay he wraps up he doesn't bring any stds home like my my health is safe as well okay cool like and personally i think that you know get her involved like have, have like have way more fun if like she finds girls for him or she joins in with these other girls like why would she have to, like she could she has a choice right she can sit there and be jealous and and be paranoid and stuff or she can like be there and know that her and her mate like him and her are going home together and that side chick is staying there or whatever right you'll probably strengthen the relationship even more strengthen the relationship. you'll be like oh my god my girlfriend's amazing she says so yeah, yeah. like th there's no there's no man on this planet who if his girl like brought another girl home for him he would leave her <laughs> Like that wouldn't happen. <laughs> no. He ain't gonna be like, oh, she's trash. Like, no, he's just he's he's uh. this girl is irreplaceable now. Like, where am I gonna find a chick who's gonna do that? Mm -hmm. Super duper rare. So of course, it's only gonna make her look better in his eyes and make him more loyal, make him want to stick around and have a, even more fun with her, and and that'll fire up his sex drive again too, if that is yeah. actually a problem. I think it's, it's it's difficult for women to wrap that around the head they just don't understand they don't understand how men work and there will be some who will understand it and they'll be like okay do you think and then there's others who will just be like no like i can't do this and it's interesting because i'm in a relationship where i thought i'm just gonna be honest i told her i'm like look every now and then i just get her just to sleep with other girls and she actually took it really well and she's like yeah it's normal you're a guy so I can, every now and then I can go off and do my thing. Keep it, you know, keep it private, secret. No one knows about it. I'm not, dis, I'm not disrespecting it. Yeah. Nobody knows. And then it actually strengthens my relationship because I, I, I naturally just all of a sudden start feeling more aroused when I'm around her. And I actually appreciate her more because maybe some of the other women that I've been with, I'm just like, oh my God, like maybe the sex is good. But then after the sex, I talk to you and I'm like, please go away. <laughs> <laughs> it also kind of like if if it, it gives her reassurance that you're with her for more than her vagina mm -hmm. because yeah. like if if the only thing that is keeping you in that relation monogamy or like in that relationship with her is the fact that she has a vagina between her legs that makes her so repla easily replaceable yeah, so fizzle out yeah like but okay it's actually proof if you step out and come back again, that's proof that she means more to you than just sex. Mm -hmm. Then there is actually some something solid, something grounded behind that relationship that is not just a, a casual sexual thing. 
that personally, I think that should put more reassurance in her brain, not less. Are you you're very honest with all the relationships which you have. I, try, certain... I, I kind of I kind of come at it from a I try to. It depends upon on the girl. I've, I've taken different tacks and stuff, but I will try to make a joke out of it on the first date that I'm going to cheat on her. Because mm -hmm. if I can deliver, if I if I try to deliver it like in the way that we're having this conversation now, it's too bo it's so boring and logical and like. It's so easy for a for a woman to be like, no, this is just like yeah. you, you haven't sold this to me the way I want it to be sold to me, right? To a guy, this this conversation makes perfect sense, right? But to a to a girl, she wants to feel like some degree of emotion around this idea. So there's t actually a couple of different ways I will, I will typically do this. One, I'll I'll make a joke on like the first date or whatever that I'm going to cheat on her ass, and I'll just I won't. I won't let down on that, and I'll, I'll like no, no, I'm I'm serious. Like, and she's cracking up laughing, and I'll just keep saying it. But so, okay, we've established this idea that I am going to cheat on you, and you you're already you're still sitting here enjoying a drink with me. You haven't left, so that kind of mean in my mind that tells me that that tells me something. Right? It tells me you're not super super pissed off about that idea. You're at least curious enough in me and where this can go to at least potentially explore that idea. Okay, great, cool. The second thing I would like to do is eroticize that idea in the bedroom by maybe through dirty talk as an example, kind of putting this idea in her head during sex that, okay, you, you're going to have to watch me with another girl at some point. Like I'm going to, I'm going to tie you up and put you in the corner and make you watch me with another girl. Like, and I'll try to eroticize this fantasy in her head. So now I, and, and, and sometimes she just will reject that idea, and that's fine. Cool. That is not. That's not going to mesh. Ain't going to happen. But sometimes she'll actually get off on that idea. It's like, okay, well, going back to what we talked about before, I've now just opened up another kind of sphere of sexuality for her, where she can explore and play around in her own head, mm -hmm. where she can now think about. She can erot if she can eroticize the idea of me being with another woman. She, maybe she might masturbate to it when I'm not in the room or something, right? Okay, well, now I've taken this thing, which it was previously like a source of pain, like cheating, right? And I've turned it into a source of pleasure. Mm. So I've just, in my eyes, I've just, I've just done a, a fantastic thing for her. So now she can enjoy this thing. I can actually be myself. I can be really who I am, a man, like unapologetically. And she gets to enjoy that as well. And it's just a massive win-win. Mm -hmm. yeah. What are your thoughts on marriage? I think in Western countries, so like America, Canada, New Zealand, Australia, UK, it's probably a terrible idea to get married like legally on paper. I don't have a problem with the concept of marriage uh, like religiously. You know, if you if if you're Christian or if you're, you're Muslim or Jewish or whatever. And you want to get, like, say, if you're a Christian, you want to get married in the church, great. Make it a religious ceremony. Cool. Don't sign that piece of paper that gets the state involved. Because this, there are so many negative incentives that have been lined up when it comes to marriage. Like, obviously, dudes get screwed over in divorce courts. Dudes get screwed over in child custody. There's like alimony payments, there's child support payments. Like all this stuff is engine. It's, it's a, a negative incentive for the woman, right? They're incentivized to like marry a guy and then leave and get alimony. That's silly, right? So if it's if it's within your religious context, like if you're a religious person, go ahead, but keep it a religious ceremony would be what I would say. Like I ain't got a problem with that at all. I think it's a beautiful thing. But to get the state involved, I think it's a terrible, terrible idea. Because, yeah, you two might love each other now, but you don't know what's going to happen in a few years' time. Let it in the line. Like, so, like women are fickle creatures, and they can turn the drop of a hat. You know. So has that has happened to you before? I've had I've had I've had exes who hate me. <laughs> they absolutely hate uh, some of my exes. Some of my exes don't hate me. Some of my exes still, you know, still like. But me. do you know why? Because they probably think that they're never ever going to get pleased 
as well as they got pleased when they were with you. They're not, oh. <laughs> not going to find another you. But some of them still really angry. <laughs> <laughs> I've 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 broken a couple of hearts here. And I'm not I'm not proud of that. But I've had I've had a couple of relationships where I've, I've really broken a girl's heart. And yeah, like hell hath no wrath. Yeah. The woman's called man. It's it's. I get it. I get it. I think I've I've been there before, and you know I'm at a point now where I might go on a date with a girl. And I get to know them, and I think, do you know what? Like this, this, this woman is so pure, and so she's such a like a good person. And I'm at a point, or I was at a point where like, you know, I wouldn't be. I'm, I'm not interested in a relationship. I just want to have some fun. And I've just thought, do you know what? I don't want to put this woman through a load of bullshit. Yeah, because I know if, if I continue this, she's going to develop feelings. I'm going to get what I want, but I don't want anything long term. So I'm going to go off, and then she's going to be. Just she probably it's not gonna take it well. Yeah. So I don't wanna I don't wanna fuck her up. So there's been a, a lot of times uh, in the past where I've just not pursued it. Is that something that you've developed as you've gotten older? Yeah. Yeah. Because you Be, just because I've I've seen how I've hurt women in the past. I've not intended to do it, yeah. but I've just seen the effects of you know them falling for me even some of the younger because if they're younger they've maybe never been in love before and then they'll fall in love with me and I don't intend for that to happen but it happens and then I'm just like I'm sorry but I I don't want this yeah and they don't understand it and then they this is like their first heartbreak and I've I've turned some women into savages and which I feel bad about but you know it's it, like I said now if I'm going out and all I want is just to get laid then I'll find someone who is also only just interested in getting laid. Right. And, it's, and, that's, and that's not that difficult. No. Like you go to the right places. Okay, cool. Yeah. Like people are here to, people are here to party, people are here to hook up. Right. There's like a kind of a mutual understanding there, right? Mm -hmm. But, you know, maybe you meet, you meet a girl at the mall, you meet a girl at the church. That, that conversation might be a slightly, slightly different one. Yeah. Right. And I, I, I completely get what you're saying because like me in my early 20s wouldn't have had that thought. But now me in my mid thirties, I'm like, yeah, like there's, I might talk to a girl and I'm like, I don't like same, same exact thought. Like you're so lovely and pure, but I just can't see myself pursuing something with you further long term that I don't want to like add an extra body. Yeah. For the sake of what? Just get my rocks off. I've had sex before. I don't really, I don't need more sex. Yeah. You know, like at this point I'm legit, I'm looking for like women I can have kids with that's legit where i'm at so it's like if i can't really see that on the horizon if i because i'm looking from the jump i'm i'm looking for like kind of maternal characteristics like hip width like can you pump out a ba couple of babies you yeah. know things like this i'm legit looking for like breeders yeah so you still pursuing that at the moment yeah i haven't yeah. got any kids yet yeah i haven't got any kids yet you're doing the Tate brothers are make it happen. Tate brothers are <laughs> spreading their seed as far as I know. They're uh, they're you know they've influenced me in in this regard. I was like they've definitely like put a lot of ideas in my head that I wouldn't have had. Yeah, uh, and I've been in a good way. I've not been in a bad way, in a positive way. And I'm like, yeah, this makes sense. Mm -hmm. This actually does make a lot of sense. You know, so I'm the same. I I I definitely want kids. Um, now probably not the best time, but. I am getting older and I think it would be an amazing experience to have kids. I've had two of my really close friends both had their first kid this year. They both had a baby girl and like it's so like I've been and I've obviously met met the girls and like you know, I've, I've got photos of me like Uncle Uncle Sterling with the baby and stuff like that mm -hmm. and I'm just I look at the I look at some of these photos a friend of mine was sending me the other day and I look at them and it reminds me like the photos are like me holding his kid it reminds me of going through like my parents' photo album when I was a kid and seeing pictures from of like really grainy photos from them in this in the 70s and 60s, like with us as kids, like sitting on like my uncle's lap or something. And I'm like, ah, like this, like this is happening now. Yeah. It, eventually I'm gonna have that photo album, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I think it's a beautiful thing. So I think one thing which is no doubt very common with a lot of people that are in relationships. When you first meet someone, 
maybe it's a couple of months or six months, the honeymoon period. Sex is amazing. You're just incredibly turned on by each other. You can't keep your hands off each other. Unfortunately, in many cases, that dies off. And maybe more so for the man, he gets bored, he's not really that interested anymore. What advice can you give to those people, I guess men, to keep the sex life healthy in a long-term relationship? So if, well, there's there's two scenarios there, right? If it's him that's losing the sex drive, right? Then I would say, look, okay, get around. Even if you don't want to cheat, let's just say you don't want to cheat, right? Just be around other women, mm. right? Just flirt with other women at least. Like just because that will, just attention from other women will raise your sex drive. Being around beautiful women raises men's testosterone levels. Like that's that's actually been proven. So if that's if you're starting to get like a little bit bored with her, your 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 wife, your girlfriend, your main your main chick, just ex, at least exposing yourself to other women, the, even the pheromones of other women, will help to sort of spark that up again a bit. Obviously, you can also start to be, be a bit more experimental, and this tends to happen in long term relationships. People tend to explore and, t- and try and test out different things, right? What I would say in regards to that, though, is don't explore too much in like the in the honeymoon stage. While the sex drive and that yeah. is still there, we have a tendency, at least I know I have a tendency to, to do this, is to try and explore all the cool, do all the cool shit. Like, I want to try this and this and this and this and this. And because you're both in the honeymoon phase, you're both super into each other, you end up doing all the stuff. And then there's kind of nowhere else to go after that. Yeah. There's no like new plateaus and new interesting things to try out. So I'd 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 say if this is you know your intent is to have something long term with this person, maybe just kind of span those things out a little bit, push them off a little bit, so that you can keep that high, keep that novelty coming in every now and then. Right now, if it's a case of like her not having the sex drive and her losing that honeymoon, he's still keen, but the honeymoon period's gone from her. Well, that's telling me that she doesn't respect that guy anymore. That's telling me that he's He's like failing somewhere, right? He's let himself go physically. He's let himself go financially. He's got no more aspirations. He's being lazy. He's just sitting around playing video games all day. He's got comfortable in the relationship. He stopped being the man that she, that he really was when she first met him, that ambitious, hungry guy. That's why she's not wanting to fuck him anymore, right? Yeah. That's why, he, and I, I agree with you know, a lot of dudes who talk about this. Like dudes have got to stay hungry and keep, working and keep trying like there's the it's it's uh you ever heard of the red queen in alice from wonderland no i think i think maybe i'm gonna bastardize the quote but i think she says in alice from wonderland the red queen is like she's just she has to run as fast as she possibly can to stay in the exact same place yeah she's like just she just this character that just sits there and runs and runs, and runs but she didn't go it doesn't go anywhere being a dude is kind of like that in relationships Whereas just to keep, like, because she got with you because she thought you were a certain type of guy. And that was probably a dude who was, like, doing well on the up and up. He had some potential. You know, he had some ambition. He had some drive. Well, you have to keep that. So you have to run as hard as you can to stay in that exact same place that you were at the very beginning of the relationship. I think, yeah, you definitely can't get too complacent. And I think I used to make this mistake all the time when I was younger, in my, my late teens, early 20s. I used to become like too obsessed with the girl. Like I liked them too much. So then when I had eventually got with them, then I was like even more obsessed with them. But I became too keen. I was like too keen, too available. And this, say for example, this maybe bad boy persona which I had beforehand, which she was initially attracted to, that changed because I was now going all soft. Yeah. And I was completely obsessed with her. Yeah. So now I'm at a point now where I can... I know how to sort of finesse the relationship and keep her interested and wanting more, but not like pushing her away. Even though, let's say, for example, I might really like her, but I mean, luckily with what I do, I'm a I'm a busy guy as it is. Yeah. So I actually don't have that much spare time to spend with uh, my woman or partner or date or whatever it might be. So they're kind of like, if I say, "Hey, Friday, Friday night, I'm free." Let's do something They're like yes, yes, yes. Let's do it. Yeah. Whereas if I was always free, then they'd be like, "Oh, this guy's too easy." A lot of guys' goal when in the bedroom will, without a doubt, be to 
try and get her to orgasm. Is there any very quick, simple tips which they can implement to achieve that? So it depends. If they want to give her like a penetrative orgasm, a squirting orgasm, like a clitoral orgasm. So there's a few, a few ways I can answer this. I think one of the, because the, some women can be a lot easier to make come from, say, cunnilingus or direct clitoral stimulation, right? And other girls can actually come quite easily from penetration. And some girls have never even come from penetration before because they just haven't had the spot hit yeah. quite right. One of the things that I teach guys that tends to get a lot of results very quickly is to manipulate angles better in the bedroom. Because penetration is all about the angles, the angles of the hips, right? Mm. So, for example, if you have your, your girl laying down in like a missionary position, right? Just simply get a pillow and prop it, like a relatively thick one, right? Prop it under her hips so you're raising her hips up a little bit. Think about what that does. What, a, a lower back? Yeah, like under here, mm -hmm. right? So she's, instead of being flat on the, the bed like that, she's now propped up a little bit like that. Like her head's here, legs here, whatever. Yeah, that's better. Legs here. <laughs> <laughs> so instead of being like flat, she is now propped up at like an angle, mm -hmm. right? What that does, let's think about like the, hopefully I can explain this properly to everyone watching at home using my amazing <laughs> puppetry. Uh, that's vagina, right? If you're going in in like normal, she's laying on her back missionary position, the angle of penetration is kind of down in that direction. But her G-spot is actually on the roof at the top of the vagina wall here, right? So if we put a pillow under her hips and we raise her hips up a bit like that, what that does is it changes that angle of penetration to be more like this, where your, the head of your penis is directly hitting against that G-spot. And you're, you're, you're going to be hitting the sweet spot and you're going to be giving her, to, you're far more likely to give her a penetrative orgasm from missionary position when her hips have changed that angle mm -hmm. very, very slightly. Another thing you can do in cowgirl position, these are the two like, like do these tonight changes that I tend to give most guys that tend to get the most results. The other one with cowgirl, most people have this impression of like, uh, cowgirl is when she's riding on top of you for anyone who's not familiar with that. People tend to copy what they see in pornography, which is not designed for pleasure <laughs> at all. It's well it's designed for the viewer's pleasure. It's, it's not designed for my it's pleasure. Purely aesthetic. It's purely for aesthetics. So in cowgirl, you tend people tend to copy that, and they tend to go up and down, with more up and down rhythmically, right? Easy change you can do in cowgirl instead is what I like to call panning for gold. So imagine like an old school like mining prospector. He's got a little pan. And they go like this with a little pan to like sieve the gold out. Imagine doing that, but with her hips. Okay. So she's on top of you, and instead of going up and down, you're backwards, moving her backwards and forwards, right? So you're she's inside of you, and that will cause the head of your penis to slam again and again and again into her G spot. Mm -hmm. And you could if this is this is when I'm especially when I'm being really really lazy, and I want to just lay up. I'm like, all right, I'm gonna get you off, and then I'm gonna go and we're we're having a happy night this will be my go-to her on top cow go like that and very very forcefully pushing her back and forth like that and slamming the head of my penis into the g-spot like that you can get a girl to come in like a minute really really quick like probably less than that if you do that with if if she's very susceptible to that kind of stimulation not every girl is they're all a little bit different in that regard some tend to prefer the clitoral stimulation a bit more but if you can get that position down pat and you can do it with enough force, you do need, you do actually need to work out. Like you do need some degree of like strength to be able to move a woman like rapidly like that. Yeah. But you can get them to pop. And a big part of getting them to orgasm in that way is kind of by take is is the element of surprise in a way. Because if a woman is in her head, she can't climax. If she, if she's thinking too much, yeah, yeah. she will never be able to come. So a, a, this is where dominance comes in by the way when you're a, when you're dominant and you're leading and you're sort of being a bit maybe more like manhandly it puts a woman in this subspace where she's not thinking anymore she's just being present and she can let go and when she can let go and not think like that she's far more orgasmic so 
when you do this little cowgirl thing, if you just do it kind of quickly and unexpectedly, like without a, giving her a chance to really think about it, she, before she knows what's happened, she's climaxed. She's like, oh, bang, pop, happy days. She's like, what the hell was that? But and she's going to remember that. <laughs> right, but it's because you, you didn't give her time to think, right? Because if you, one of the worst things a guy can do, and this might also, I'm giving you like a bunch of different answers. I know you answered for one thing. No, that's good stuff though. One of the worst things a guy can do in the bedroom is try to please his partner too much. Like be so desperate to please her. Have that, I mean, I mean, having that kind of energy, that, that attitude, because she, women are very, very good at picking up on vibes from guys. They're very, very good at picking up body language. She will know instantly if you are desperate to make her orgasm. You know, if you go into, into sex with this, like, oh, I, I, I need to make her come. Otherwise I won't feel like a man. Or I need to make her come. Otherwise I'll feel worthless or I'll feel inadequate in the bedroom or whatever it is, right? That kind of desperation, she will feed off of that and it will only make it worse. It'll put her in her head because if the guy needs to make her come, well, now you've, he's just put a whole bunch of pressure on her and now she's in her head and she's like, oh God, if I don't, if I don't come, then he's going to feel self-conscious. I don't want to upset him. I don't want to bruise his ego, blah, 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 blah. Now what's she doing? She's just yeah. hamster wheeling, thinking in her head again and again. And then she ain't present. She ain't paying attention to what the sensations she's feeling. All you've done is put her in her head. So by it sound, this is what I, uh, the frame of mind I recommend guys go into the bedroom with. It sounds counterintuitive, but I call it the selfish pervert frame of mind. So you're selfish. You're not selfish in the regard of like, oh, I'm going to pump for 30 seconds and bust and I'm going to sleep. You're not selfish in that regard. You're selfish in the regard of, I'm going to do things to her for my own perverse mm -hmm. amusement. Like she's my sexual muse and she's just along for the thrill of the ride. You know, it's not like I'm doing them just to please her. I'm doing them because I enjoy exploring her body and I enjoy, I enjoy getting her off more than she enjoys getting off herself, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. uh, but it, it is, and it's, it's selfishness in a perverted kind of way, which stops you from having that mentality of, oh, I desperately need to please her. And it makes you a little bit more dominant and, and kind of masculine in your approach to things too. Yeah. It's interesting because the less I have cared about pleasing her, the more they've been pleased. <laughs> uh, <laughs> surprise, surprise. <laughs> right? So when you, when you combine that kind of mentality with like, because you obviously know what you're doing as well, mm -hmm. right? Because you've got experience. So when you combine that correct mentality with like the practical know-how, I guess, of, of what to do exactly in the bedroom, then it's game over. It's super easy to make a girl like have, give a girl extremely memorable and enjoyable experience in the bedroom. Do you think all men should go down on their partner? You know what? This is this is a question that I never even thought about prior to getting into this kind of space on the internet, like the 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 manus, manosphere space, the red pill space, the the men's self help space. And I started seeing guys like saying things, particularly on Twitter for some reason. Uh, to the effect of, if a ma if a man goes down on a woman, then she will lose respect for him. I've heard people say this this phrase quite a lot, and so, and some guys I know, some friends of mine, they don't do it for that exact reason. They don't. Some guys just don't like it. Cool. I personally fucking love going down on chicks. I love going, and I I'm but I'm also really really good at it. Like I pract I was doing this professionally, like as an escort for like a number of years. I know what to do. So I kind of I get off on the fact that I can like control her body in that way, yeah, yeah, yeah. and she can't do anything about it, right? She's got you got no choice. Like you're gonna orgasm, ha 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 ha. <laughs> but at the same time, my my uh, my take on that kind of argument of if okay, it's sub it's submissive, it's beta. If a dude goes down on his chick, if, if a guy goes down on his chick, she won't respect him. My my take on that is if if she loses respect for you because you went down on her. She didn't respect you in the first place. Yeah. It, that's pretty basic. Like, so like my take is like, if you enjoy it, 
go ahead, do it. Like it's it's like it's your sex life. Like it's your body. Like you guys can do whatever the hell you want in the consent of your own bedroom. Like and I, like I know that if you rock a girl's world and everything else you do in the bedroom is extremely dominant and you can eat pussy in a dominant way too like yeah just you just flip her upside down mm -hmm. like all of a sudden like i'm up here she's down there it's a, it's a different dynamic completely you know i i used to i did it and then at university had a very bad experience and that was my own foolish mistake i guess because this was after a long night out and i decided oh, i'll go down on them and it was like it was absolutely rank so I went through a period of years where I never did it again because I was so shocked by it. But then I got into a relationship with this girl who loved it. And that was how, like, that was how she had the, the strongest orgasms. So I had no choice. So I got back into it. <laughs> Gun to the head. And I was in that relationship for quite a while. So by the end of that relationship, my tongue was jacked. And I knew, I actually started to enjoy it again. Yeah. So like you said, I, I, I've got to a point as well where you know, I, I, because I know how to do it and I've got a stamina to do it. I actually enjoy doing it because it blows their mind if you do it properly. Yeah. The, so I learned when, when my first ever girlfriend, mm -hmm. like the girl I lost my virginity to, like we were dating for like three years or whatever when I was like 16, 17, eight, like so super, super duper horny. And I'm like, I want to know everything about like the female body mm -hmm. and like you're my girlfriend. So for me, it was just like, and you know, obviously and we were exclusive, whatever. So like she ain't, cheating or anything so it's just like that was same thing S super duper strong tongue i could do that shit for, for forever and i got really good at it and when you're good at something you enjoy it yeah i think yeah so it's like it's like it's, it's less it's less about like her pleasure in general and i'm sure as a kind of like corollary corollary to that there's probably like the girls who give the best blowjobs are the ones who enjoy doing it yeah. Right. The girl that gives you a blowjob with that mad enthusiasm, it's awesome. Yeah, you don't but, want them like Yeah. The girl who gives like the chore job is like, <laughs> this is like just stop, honey. Like move <laughs> along. You know? Yeah, yeah. So I think that I think that applies both ways. Yeah. What about squirting? You think all women have the capability of squirting? Correct. They well, all can do it, yes. Yeah. They have but, the, they but a lot the, of them the plumbing. But a lot of them have never experienced it. Correct. So there's a difference between what you see in a porno and the real world. Mm -hmm. So anytime you see a porno, and if if the title of the porno can say contains the word squirt, it's usually it's fake. Oh uh, yeah, because it, look, squirting schoolgirls forty seven, right? I guarantee you that actress was backstage drinking a, a gallon of water prior to the scene, and she is just pissing on everyone. <laughs> I know this for a fact, okay? Because she has to produce a ridiculous amount of fluid yeah. for, the, for the camera. So that, that's the scene we're shooting today. So she needs to projectile. Yeah, I've, right? I've, I've seen some of them. I've been literally baffled. Yeah. In my more naive days, I was like, how is this possible? Well, she's carrying all of this around all day? <laughs> so <laughs> secret compartment? <laughs> <laughs> the part, the compartment's called the bladder. Uh, <laughs> Now, however, the when a girl actually squirts, like le, like real, like legit squirt, it comes from a thing called the skein's gland, mm -hmm. which is kind of like the, the female equivalent of the prostate. So it actually produces this fluid, and you you stimulate it. It's like behind the behind the G spot, and you can stimulate that, and you can produ it produces a different type of orgasm and a different type of sensation for the woman. So it's distinctly different feeling uh, when they they climax that way, but. It's all in the same kind of area as the bladder. So sometimes a bit more. Sometimes they'll also like give out a bit of piss as well if they don't really have super duper control over it or if they just have a really full bladder. So like squirt is real, but a lot of the times there is pee involved. Mm. Yeah. Do you think men should actively be trying to make women squirt or do you think it doesn't really matter as long as you make them come? Yeah, it's fun. Yeah. Like if they've never done it before, especially if they've never done it before, it's super fun. Yeah, they'll remember that first time, won't they? Yeah. See, exactly, right? And it ain't that hard. Yeah. It's just like, uh, you remember those like startup lawnmowers? Yeah, yeah. As a kid? Yeah. Yeah, lawnmower, right? Like, again, for people at home. Well, I'm sure, <laughs> have you put together a, a book on this? I've got a whole video course on it. Okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, yeah. 
detailed. <laughs> <laughs> but with my hand puppets, we can, we can get as close to the real thing as possible. Vagina, hand, hands in the rock and roll position and invert them. And you're going up like that. Mm -hmm. And you're slamming these fingers basically forcefully into the G-spot on the roof of her vaginal wall. And you're doing it like a uh, side guard, right? Like jujitsu. Yeah. She's laying there. I'm on the side like this. Head's here, feet here. And I'm coming in from this angle. And it's like starting a lawnmower. You're going very, very quite forcefully and quite quickly. And you, if you again, element of surprise. If you kind of pull, pull this out of the bag and you do it, you can get it to score it within like 30 seconds. I could, but you, it's again, you need, you need some yeah, yeah. force, like strong forearms. So I, I can't do it with my left hand. I can only do it right handed. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, I've, I've enjoyed this conversation. It's been funny. Mate, it's been great. Yeah. yeah. Well, if, so for, for everyone watching this, if they want to find out more about you, where can they find you? On YouTube, you just type in Sterling Cooper. Sterling is spelled S T I R L I N G. And you'll find my YouTube channel. I give out a ton of free advice on, on, Things like how to squirt, how to teach a girl how to squirt. Uh, you can go to Sterling Wisdom is my Twitter account. My Instagram was, uh, until about 17 hours ago, it was at Cooper Sterling. Maybe that will come back. Maybe it won't. We'll see. And I enjoy the things you post on Instagram, particularly your th stories. Thank you. Uh, I have a fantastic <laughs> meme collection, yeah. which the world is currently being deprived of. It's, it's a shame. Uh, or you can go to sterlingcooper.com and you can access, you can, you can find everything else there as well. And you can find, that's where you can find all my uh, my books and my, my video courses. And you can also find my free ebook, uh, which is called The Five Subtle Mistakes Men Make in the Bedroom and How to Fix Them. You can get that for free on stillingcooper.com and uh, learn about that too. Awesome, man. Yeah. I, uh, I appreciate you coming down. I'm uh, sure it'll probably be a part two. We'll, uh, we'll get some else sorted out as well. Let's do it.